All right, everybody. I think Miss Julie's got us going. Uh, welcome back to the live broadcast from New Bethel Baptist here in Carnesville, Georgia. Actually, from our living room tonight, with the uh, broadcast on behalf of New Bethel. Most of all, on behalf of the Lord tonight. But uh, appreciate everybody joining us. We uh, did not meet in the sanctuary uh, this week due to due to someone in our church having the coronavirus a couple weeks ago. So uh, hopefully. Um, this Sunday, we will get back in the sanctuary, and uh, but anyway, we appreciate everybody being with us tonight, and joining in with us, and hope and pray the Lord blesses you, uh, pray that he blesses you as much as he has me uh, with this message, but um, if you want to be turning in your Bibles, where we're going to read tonight, we'll read one verse out of the Gospel of John, chapter 14. And then we'll skip over into the sixth chapter of the book of 2 Kings. So that's John chapter 14 and 2 Kings chapter 6 is where we'll be reading at tonight. And uh, while everybody is getting turned to that, we would like to make mention of a few prayer requests tonight. Let's uh, continue to remember uh, Miss uh, Francine Elsner and Johnny. Ms. Francine is not doing very good. Got a message from Diane today that uh, her mom seems to really be going down fast. Y'all remember uh, that whole family in the prayers. Diane said that Johnny uh, was having a very difficult time with it, and I know he is. So Y'all remember them in your prayers. Uh, Francis Miller, uh, Gail Pritchett's mom, Gail sent a message out today that she tested negative for COVID uh, this week, and that's good news. But she started back eating a little bit and has gained, I think, four pounds. So that's good news. Continue to remember uh, Mr. Sammy Elrod. Sammy will be having surgery next week. I believe it's July the 9th, if I'm not mistaken. So on uh, his vertebrae and his neck. So uh, let's remember Brother Sammy in our prayers. And I know there's a lot of other uh, things going on, lots of sickness and things. Uh, remember Miss uh, Lita Ryder in your prayers as she uh, recovers from COVID. I, uh, the last I heard, she just had mild symptoms. But let's remember uh, Miss Nita. Let's remember our nation. Let's remember our leaders. Let's remember our uh, our men in the uniform, whether they're in the military, the police, our first responders, nurses, doctors. Uh, lots to be praying for tonight. So, uh, so before we do get any further, we do want to open up in a word of prayer uh, tonight. So let's all bow our heads and let's pray. Lord, we just want to thank you, Heavenly Father, for the privilege to come back, Lord, and, and, and Lord, just to open up your word and, and bring a message, Heavenly Father, that, Lord, that you have laid on our heart. Lord, we thank you, Lord, for the opportunity, Lord, to, Lord, broadcast this message out, Lord, that people may hear it, and, Lord, that they may know, Heavenly Father, that your word is still, Lord, being preached and being taught all across the land, Heavenly Father, Lord, we pray. Lord, that you would just take and revelate our minds, our hearts, dear Lord, that, Lord, you would bring forth, Lord, the words that you would have us to say, Lord, and you would just speak through us, dear Lord, and, and Lord, you would bring your word to life, Heavenly Father, that we might be able to take and, and apply it to our lives, Heavenly Father, and live out the fulfillment of your will for our lives, Lord, and Lord, I pray, Lord, for all these requests that have been made mentioned, and I know, Lord, there's also many, many others, Heavenly Father, that Lord, that you would just have your will away in each circumstance, dear Lord. And, and Lord, you just Lord, you just be what people need you to be. And I know you will be, Heavenly Father. And Lord, we pray, Lord, for those out there listening, dear Lord, that you would touch their hearts tonight with your word. And Lord, not anything that we might say, Lord, but something that you might say through us, Lord. And, and Lord, we thank you, Lord, for your word. We thank you, dear Lord, for how it pertains to our life today. Lord, how relevant it is, dear Lord, even Lord, in this time, dear Lord, and how important it is that we get in your word. So, Lord, just lead us, guide us, direct us, use us, Lord, for your honor and your glory. Forgive us for we have sinned and failed you. Lord, we give you all the honor and the praise and the glory. For it is in Jesus' name we do pray. Amen. Amen. Well, tonight, if we had a thought that we want to uh, try to preach on with the Lord's help, it, it would simply be doubters beware. Doubters beware. Beware, and that's that's what the Lord has laid on our heart this week, and and, and just been thinking a lot uh, lately, and, and and I guess I guess dealing with some of my own doubt, you know, as as, as strong as our faith seems to be sometimes, 
it's very easy, especially during troubled times, for doubt to begin to, to creep into our hearts and our minds. And, 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 and doubt, once it comes in and begins to settle in and, and take root in our lives, it can really prevent us uh, from fulfilling God's will. And that's that, I don't want that to happen in my life, and I don't want it to happen in your life. I want God's perfect will to be fulfilled in us and through us that uh, we might bring him ultimate glory and honor, that we might see lost people saved, that we might see uh, our church lifted up and on fire for him, that we might see our communities turn back to God. And, and if we're doubting, then we can't do that. We, we've got to be strong in our faith and, and strong in our belief, and we've got to trust in him and know that the Lord's got a plan through all this. Uh, but John chapter 14, uh, verse number 12 uh, it is a very, very powerful uh, little verse here in the Bible. And, and of course, Jesus, he is, he is teaching on the discourse of, uh, in chapter 14, of course, the, the famous verse that, verses that Jesus taught, let not your heart be troubled, you believe in God, uh, believe also in me and my Father's house or many mansions. And how in this same verse, he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, that no man cometh unto the Father but by me. But I want us to focus on verse number 12, what he said in that verse, where he says this. He says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me, the works that I do shall he do also, and greater works than these shall he do, because I go unto my Father. And, and you know what? That, that verse right there has so much power, so much significance, so much meaning in it. Christ is, you, you know, he's going he's to begin to tell them that he's going to send uh, that of the Holy Comforter back to them. And, and here Christ is. He said, look, he that believeth in me, he's going to do, listen, he's going to do the works that I do and greater works that I do is he going to do. And, and I thought about that. How, how could that be? How could we do what Christ did? How, and how could those works even be greater through us than they were when he walked physically on the face of this earth. And I think the explanation lies with the, with the fact that, that once we're believers, once we are saved by the blood of Christ, the Holy Spirit of the Lord Jesus Christ lives within each of us. And we have an individual uh, relationship with him. And we have an individual communication with him. And we have the ability to walk hand in hand with him and allow him to be led. And by that and through that, the gospel message is extended when we're true believers and we're walking in the will of God and carrying out our faith and living out our faith. We're walking hand in hand, all of us as individuals. We are the church, but the church is composed of individual believers in Christ. And, when, and, that, and we're expanded by that to do not only the works that Christ did, but, but more so because there's more of us. He, he's, he, he's, he's extended out beyond what he could do just in the flesh by being one man. And, and, and you go back and you look, and Christ did great works while he was on earth. He, he healed people. He, he, he made the blind to see, the deaf to hear, the lame to walk, and did all these great things to cause people's faith to become whole, and did all these great things. But then you go... And you read after Christ ascended back to the Father, sitting on the right hand of the throne, he sends the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost to the 120 uh, that were gathered there. They go out and begin to preach the gospel in the power of the Holy Spirit. And that's the key. If, if we're going to do what God wants us to do, then it's got to be done in the power of the leadership of the Holy Spirit. Listen, they begin to see thousands get born again into the kingdom of God. They, they begin to see thousands get saved and, 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 and turn their backs on all the things of the world and turn to God through Jesus, through the power of the Holy Spirit. And, and, and I don't want us to doubt that today. I, I don't want us to think, you know, that, that, that we don't have that same power today. And I think so many of us, we get so focused on our circumstances and so focused on our surroundings and world events that's happening around us that we forget that we are the vessel of the Holy Spirit. We're the temple of the Holy Spirit, and we can be used by the Lord to do great things even in the year 2020. You, you know, and I, you might, if you 
you haven't heard me preach very much, you've heard me say this. And and, and, and Andy Bond, I, I got this from Andy Bond one time, and, and looked it up, and it's a true saying. Gypsy Smith, he was a, a revival preacher back in the late 1800s, early 1900s, and uh, Gypsy Smith got to be a part of a lot of great revivals. And somebody asked him one time, said, Gypsy, what, what's the... What's the key to revival? What, what's the secret? What you know? What, what do you have to do to have revival? And 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 Jesse Smith said this. He said, "Well, I don't really know." He said, "But I'll tell you what. If you'll do this, if you'll take it, and you'll draw a circle around yourself, and if you'll pray and ask God to send revival on everything in that circle, which is you." He said, just pray and pray and pray and ask God to send revival on everything in that circle. And he said, don't leave that circle until he does. He said, and I can tell you this, you may not ever experience a worldwide revival. You may not ever experience a nationwide revival. You may not ever even experience a churchwide revival. He said, but what you will experience will be a personal revival. And through that personal revival, though, is when we, when we get revived by the Holy Spirit of God, we step outside of that circle and then we go, we begin to affect other people. We, we begin to share that gospel message. We begin to spread that revival fire that ought to be lit in us. Even in this time that we're going through, God's children should still be on fire for Him. We, we shouldn't be so worried and, and contemplating all the things of the world. We, we should be saying, Lord, where's the open door? Lord, where's, where's, where's the path? Lord, where's Where's the way you want me to go? Lord, where's that lost soul that you want me to witness to? Lord, where's where, where's that person that's down and out that I can encourage? Lord, where, where, where's that person that's angry that I can share some peace with them through your gospel? And, 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 and listen, we don't need to doubt that. Because when we begin to doubt, we become ineffective. And the last thing I want to do in this life is be an ineffective tool in God's great toolbox. I, I I want to be, I want to be the most handy toolish guy. I want to be the one that when he needs something, he says, there's a tool that I can use and, and he'll pull me out and use me in whatever facet that he wants to use me in. And that's my desire. And I pray that, that we would all have that desire, but if we're doubt, we can't have that. So now let's get into a story in 2 Kings chapter 6. And most of you already know I love to, to read and study and preach out of Old Testament, see how it relates to the new and, and see how it relates even in the last day. And I think there's a great message in this passage of Scripture about doubt. And we're going to see it uh, take place here in this story in, in the Bible. But now listen, let, let me kind of set the table just a little bit here. Uh, uh, Elijah is the prophet in Israel. He has, he, he, he's come after Elijah has has went on to be with the Lord and Elisha. He is now the, the prophet of Israel. He's a great man of God, does, does great things. And, and, and in the first part of chapter 6, you know, we know the story how that, that, that Elijah, uh, the king of Syria, uh, he brought his army down and surrounded Elijah and his servant and, and how God smote him with blindness and he brought him to the king of, of Israel in Samaria and how that, that, that God gave him a great victory without even having to fight a battle. God gave them a great victory, and, and no doubt Israel was lifted up, and they, they were basking in the glory of this victory. And, and listen, I know I know when the year 2020 hit, I was really thinking, man, this is going to be an awesome year. It's going to be just great. I mean, the, the economy was thriving. People were going back. People were working, and it seemed like our church was starting to, to grow again and really take off. We were just getting settled in as being the new pastor at New Bethel. And, and man, I was like, oh, this is going to be awesome. And then all of a sudden, here comes this virus, this pandemic that, that just swept across the whole face of the world and, and just changed has changed our lives for a little bit. And, and, and who knows for how long, maybe forever in some ways. But, but it just kind of, you know, it just kind of took the momentum and just took it out from under us. And listen, I don't care how high you may be in life. I don't care how many mountaintop experiences that you have or, or that you've been on or you may be on right now. There's always a valley waiting. There, there's always going to be ups and downs in our lives. So, yes, Israel had a great victory without even having to fight. Uh, listen, because of the power of God. But as soon as that victory is over, not long thereof, 
that the king of Syria, he's going to declare war on the Israelites again. And uh, let's start reading with verse number 24 of 2 Kings chapter 6. And we'll read a couple verses, then we're going to skip around a little bit in this chapter. But verse 24 of the Bible says, And it came to pass after this that the Ben-Hadad, king of Syria, gathered all his hosts and went up and besieged Samaria. And there was a great famine in Samaria, and behold, they besieged it until the ass's head was sold for fourscore pieces of silver and the fourth part of a, of a cab of doves dung for five pieces of silver. So, so we see the we, we see the besieging of the enemy. The, the king of Assyria, the Bible said that he besieged the city of Samaria, which would have been that of the capital city of the nation of Israel at this time. And, and, and he besieged the city. And besieged means to, to surround, to cut off, to, to capture, to, to enclose. He had them trapped. He had them closed in. And, and, and the Bible said not only... Uh, uh, with the people of Samaria, they were besieged by the by, by the king of Syria, but, but there also was a great famine in Samaria. And, and no doubt during this time of famine where there's no available food or, 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 or resources to eat or food to grow, then, then this would have been a time that the, the Israelites, the Samaritans, that they, they, they would have sent out people to go and, and, and get food from other places, other sources, and bring it into the city. But they couldn't do this. That they were besieged. And I know a lot of you right now feel like you're besieged. Do you feel like maybe that, that, that this pandemic has besieged your life? It, it has surrounded you. It has closed you in. It has, it has limited you to, to where you can go and what you can do. I, I know our churches, you know, we seem like we're a little bit besieged right now. And, 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 and maybe some of you, even with your income, you feel besieged because Maybe your work is suffering because of this pandemic. I know that, that, that everybody seemed like was kind of getting back to some normalcy in here. Seems like last last week, week and a half or so, we, we've had another wave come through and the numbers are rising. And, and honestly, I, I don't I don't know what to believe, what to think. I, you know, but I know it's serious, but but we feel the seas, we feel enclosed, we feel entrapped, and, and really don't know what to do. And it's easy when we get to that place. To begin to doubt, to begin to doubt if God really cares or God's doing anything about this, if He, if, 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 if God understands how bad it is or how bad we want to be back in our churches, how bad we want to go back to work, how, how bad, listen, this would have been the uh, last week would normally have been the week that, that we would have went to Mississippi and been on a mission trip in Mississippi and we kind of had to put that off and and you guys pray with us about that, that God's going to open those doors and make it work where we can uh, continue to do that somewhere, sometime. And, but, 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 you know, that, that bothered me. And I would wake up and I'd think, man, we, we should be in Mississippi doing God's work. But, but, but listen, just because we're besieged doesn't mean that we need to doubt. Listen, I, I believe that, that God's still going to do something great. I believe that God's still going to work in this, and, and I believe he's going to change hearts, and, and not only the pandemic, but all this social stuff that's going on in our land today, how that has besieged our minds and, and our thoughts, and a lot of us, our attitudes and our anger. It seems like everybody is a little angry right now on one side or the other about something, and, and how we've been besieged by the politicians, it seems like. We're we're in an election year, and as time goes on, man, I tell you what, I, I never thought much about an election year when I was a, a kid or even a young man, but now it just seems like there's just misery everywhere during an election year, and we're in that. And a lot of us feel besieged by that, and, it, and, it, and, and that's, what's, that, that's what's driving our thoughts. That's what's driving our attitude. That's what's driving our, our actions and our words a lot of times. Let me say this, hold on, hold on, look to the Lord, trust him, don't, 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 don't give up, don't, give, don't doubt God, he's still working in all this, I, I still feel it in my heart, I tell you what, if nothing else, you want to know what God's done for me, he, he has brought his word back to life for me, he has really allowed me some time to, to get into his word and and read it like I hadn't read it like I should and, 
and get to know it a lot better. And, and man, it feels good. And, and I believe God's doing that to prepare us that, that when, when this besieging is over, then we can go forth and we can be soul winners uh, for him. Uh, let, let's get down. So we, we, we see that the city of Samaria is besieged to the point that, that they're selling donkey heads and, and, and dove, dove poop to eat. And, and, and it's, you know, and there's hardly even enough of that to, to go around. But that's what they're eating and trying to live off of. That's how bad it was. So you think it's bad for us. Imagine being a, a member of the, of, of the, the, the Israelites at this time in the city of Samaria. So let, let's go down to verse number 30 in that same chapter and see what it says. The Bible says, And it came to pass when the king heard the words of the woman that he rent his clothes and he passed by the wall and the people looked and behold, he had sackcloth within upon his flesh. So, so the king of Samaria, the king of Israel, he's destitute. He just, he just heard this, this story. This woman cried out to him that had boiled her son and they had eaten her son with a promise that they were going to eat another lady's child the next day and that lady went and hid this son. So the king is just in destitute. He, he's besieged also with all that's going on. But listen to what he does in verse number 31. It says, Then he said, God do so and more also to me if the head of Elisha, the son of Shaphat, shall stand on him this day. So, so, so you know what? You know what? The, 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 what, what the king of Israel, and if you go with me, skip down to verse number 33. I want to read the last part of that verse. It says, Behold, this evil is of the Lord. What should I wait for the Lord any longer? So you know what the king of Samaria is doing, the king of Israel is doing? He's blaming God. He's blaming the prophet Elisha. He, he, he tells that, he says, if Elijah, if his head is still on his shoulders by tomorrow, then I'm going to be surprised. And, and, and he goes on in verse 33 and says, this evil is of the Lord. Why should I wait any longer for the Lord? Doubt, listen, doubt had already, and, and you go back and read the beginning of the chapter, God had just blessed this man with the great victory. God had done great things for him. He had delivered him out of the hand of the Syrians. And here he is. All of a sudden, it's, it's God's fault. And, and so we see the besieging. Now we see the blame. And, and, and listen, I, I know there's a lot of blame going on in the world today. Everybody's blaming everybody else for this and for that. You know, it's, it's this person's fault or this country's fault or this race's fault or this or that. And, and a lot of blaming going on in the world right now. And you know what happens when, we're, when we get into the blame game? When you get into the blame game, you become so focused on everybody else that you forget about what are you doing yourself. And, and, and listen, my, this, whole, the, this life that I have, that, that God is allowing me to live, the whole purpose I believe that I'm still alive, I was saved as a nine-year-old boy, so, so the Lord can take me out of here anytime he wants and, and bring me to glory, and I'm good, but he's chosen not to. He's chosen to leave me here. Now, he didn't leave me here and promise me everything would be a bed of roses and everything would be good. Yes, I'm blessed. I realize that. I know that. But that's by the hand of God. It's not by anything that I've earned or deserved. It's by the hand of God. But when we start to blame people, we take focus off of ourselves and we cast it onto somebody else. And, and, and then all of a sudden, that's what drives our thoughts. That's what drives our actions. Listen, what we need to do is we need to focus on our relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. I can promise you this, if we were all, and I'm talking about when I say all, that little powerful three-letter word that includes everybody, if we would all walk closer to God, if we would all take the life that Jesus lived for us, to, uh, for us to see, and we would walk in that path, that straight and narrow way, then we wouldn't have to blame everybody for what's going on. We, we can be accountable ourselves to the Lord God Almighty. And, and folks, the truth of the matter is, that's who I'm ultimately accountable to because he is the one and the true righteous judge. So we got all this blame going on in our world today. And it's just, blame just creates, you know, it creates dissension and it, and it creates separation and it creates anger and, and all this, listen, I, 
I, you, you know whose fault it is? I, what, what's the old saying we have? It's the devil's fault. When we was kids, mom and the devil made me do it. And, and, and listen, but we have bought into that. And, and even us as saved people, even us as believers, have bought into a lot of that. And, and it's everybody else's fault that our, what our problems are. Listen, the biggest problem I face today is right here. It's me. The man in the mirror. The man that I see. That's the biggest problem I face today. And blaming anybody else for any of my shortcomings or any of my problems, it doesn't do any good. I got to take note of myself. And I got to make sure that my relationship with Jesus is where it needs to be and it's what it needs to be. And, and, and I'm giving myself over wholly to him, to, to walk with him and to be guided by him and, to, and just to, for his will to be lived through me. And, and that is so important in our walk every day of our lives, not just on Sundays or Wednesdays, but every day of our life is not to look who we can blame for our problems, but to take accountability for ourselves to get up, say, Lord, through the power of your Holy Spirit, help me to overcome the deficiencies of my mind, the deficiencies of my flesh, and let me be led forth by the Holy Spirit and be powerful in your love and your mercy and your grace and be a witness for your kingdom, then we wouldn't have to worry about playing the blame game. We can actually start doing some good out here in the world. Let's read on and see what happens in this scripture. Elijah, once he begins to be blamed and God begins to be blamed, Elijah's going to step up and he, Elijah's going to do a little prophesying right here. The Bible says, then Elijah said, verse number one, chapter seven, then Elijah said, hear ye the word of the Lord, Thus saith the Lord, tomorrow about this time shall a measure of fine flour be sold for a shekel and two measures of barley for a shekel in the gate of Samaria. So Elijah saying that there's going to be a, a great turnaround tomorrow. Tomorrow things are going to be completely different. We're, we're not going to be eating donkey heads and, 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 and dove poop. We're, we're, we're going to be eating fine flour and, and, and barley. And, uh, and and listen to what listen to what happens here in verse number two. Then a Lord on whose hand the king leaned answered the man of God and said, Behold, if the Lord would make windows in heaven, might this thing be? And he said, Behold, thou shalt see it with thine eyes, but shall not eat thereof. So so hear this hear this Lord and the king's hierarchy is and. And when he hears Elijah say this, he, he begins to mock Elijah and, and said, Behold, if the Lord would make windows in heaven, might this thing be. In other words, what he was saying is, God's going to have to pour down manna from on high again for this to happen. In other words, he doubted what the prophet, what the man of God said. See, when we get caught, so caught up in, in, in looking at our circumstances and looking at how bad things are instead of looking at how great our God is and how in control our God is and, and how that nobody's to blame, that we need to step up and step out and be faithful to the Lord. Listen, when that happens, when we get so caught up in that, then, then, then we begin to belittle the power of God. And, and that's what this man was doing. He was belittling the prophecy of, 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 the, of the man of God, the prophet of God, a, a tried prophet, a, a man who had, who had been found to, to, to be true to his word when, when he spoke about what God was going to do. And, and, and who this Lord is, this leader in the, in the, in the king's realm, and, and, and he said it can't happen. I, so Elijah, you know what Elijah says? Well, guess what? You're going to see it with your eyes, but you're not going to get to partake of it. Why? Because he doubted in the Lord. He doubted in God's word. And, and, and I want to encourage you today, there's no reason to doubt. There's absolutely no reason to doubt God tonight. He, he, listen, he's on the throne as much today as, he, as he's ever been. And, and, and this, the, the earth is still his footstool. And, 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 and listen, he, he still can calm the winds or the storms. He he, he still can say to this mountain, and it'll move. He, he can straighten out the valleys. He's still God. He still don't not doubt what he can do. And God can bring us out of this. He can bring us out of this pandemic. He can bring us out of this social mess. He can bring us out of this political mess. And listen, when he does, I, I don't want to be one of the doubters. I don't want to be one of the ones that misses out on the blessings because I spent my whole time while all this was going on doubting that God could bring us out of it. 
God can bring us. God's going to bring us out of it. He's going to. He's God. Listen, the Bible says they've never seen his seed begging bread. That, that's the kind of God he is. So the Bible says, verse number three, Listen, watch how God works here. The, 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 so we, we've got the besieging, we've got the blame, we've got the belittling of God's word. And, and I know that, that a lot of people want to mock the church right now. A lot of people want to laugh at the church because we try to stand up for what the word of God says. We, we, we Listen, I don't worry about being politically correct. I don't worry about being socially correct. What I worry about is being biblically correct. If I'm biblically correct, then everything else will take its place. Because God ultimately is who I'm going to have to answer to one of these days. Not, 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 not to government, not, not to social police, not, not social media. Not, not but I'm going to have to answer to God. And uh, so they may be belittling us and belittling our stance and belittling our faith and, and saying that, that we're never going to get out of this, but we are. Verse number three says that there were four leprous men at the entering end of the gate. And they said one to another, why sit we here until we die? If we say we will enter into the city, then the famine is in the city and we shall die there. And if we sit still here, we die also. Now therefore come and let us fall into the host of the Syrians. If they save us alive, we shall live and if they kill us, we shall but die. So, so what? Here we are. We've got the city of Samaria. We've got the Syrian armies. Got it besieged. Got it surrounded. We've got four leprous men who's been cast out of the city because they're lepers and they're unclean. They're not allowed to live in the city. And here they are by the city gate. And, 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 and here they are. They're lepers. No cure for them. No, no hope for them. They're just sitting there, and here they are, and they're in a dilemma. They said, hey, if we go into the city, we're going to die. Either, you know, the famine's in the city, so we'll just starve to death. If the leprosy doesn't kill us, starvation's going to kill us. Or maybe they stone us because we're lepers and we're unclean. I don't know, but we're not going into the city. If we sit right here where we're at, they're going to kill us. If we're going to die because we're going. there's no food here. There's nothing to sustain us here. But that's the host of the Syrians. We'll, we'll just go and cast ourselves at their mercy and we'll see what happens. And that's the decision that they made. And I wonder today, church, when, when, when people out there that are, that are in a dilemma, when, when people out there that, that are lost, when the lost people, when, when they're looking around, who, who are they saying would be the best person to come and cast themselves at the mercy to? I tell you what a lot of people's doing because of how they've seen us act, us as believers, us as the church, they'd rather go cast themselves at the mercy of the world and see how the world treats them because they've already seen how the church treats them. We've got to be careful. We need to love people. We need to be there for people. I wonder today, and, I, and this wasn't even anything God just laid in my heart till, till right now, but I wonder when people get in a bleak situation, like a lot of people's in right now, who are they going to look to cast themselves at? Is it going to be us, the church? Are we opening our hearts? Are we opening our arms? Are we saying, bring the filth, bring the sinners, bring the, the drunkards, the drug addicts, the, 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 the all these that we don't agree with, bring them in and let us love on them and let us give them the gospel of Jesus? Are we saying, you know what? Just go try the world. I mean, these, these leprous men, and no doubt they were they, they were citizens of the city of Samaria. They liked their chances better with the enemy than they did in the city. And I wonder today. I wonder if lost people, when they look around and they ask themselves, what should be the best way to go? Are we giving them the best way to go? Are we showing them that Jesus Christ is full of grace and mercy and love and that he died for them, that he gave his life for them, that if they would come and fall on their knees and repent of their sins and believe in him with all their hearts that they might be saved? Are we showing them that? Do they see that in us? 
Or do they say, you know what, I'd be better off to go out there to the enemy that's got the church besieged and cast myself at their mercy and see what these men were so they were in such a bleak state and with no hope from their from their city that they said, we'll just go to the enemy. Now God was going to use that to work a great miracle. But folks, you know what God wants to do? He wants to use you and he wants to use me for his kingdom work. He wants to use the church. You, you know, I, I was talking to a gentleman Sunday after after we had our drive-in service and we, we were talking and, and it, it, I was brought back to, to, to a quote, I believe it was Lance Havner said years ago, and it's even more prevalent today than it was then. But, but, he, but he said this, he said, you know, he said the church used to be a rescue boat for the parachute, but now it's become a cruise ship for the privileged. And I wonder how many that look at the church and say, I'm not welcome, I'm Nobody wants to see me there. Nobody would understand me. Listen, you come. You come. And let us let us love on you. Let us share the gospel with you. Listen, I can't change you. But I can point you to one who can. And his name is Jesus. And his mercy is great because he gave it to me. And his grace is limitless because he gave it to me. He can, he can save your soul. He can change your life. You don't have to cast yourself at the mercy of the world. Come cast yourself at the mercy of one who died for your sins but gave his life for you. I beg you today. I beg you that if you're out there listening, maybe maybe you've been trying to, to decide, is it, is, it, is it time for me to be saved? And God's dealing with your heart and he's knocking on your heart's door and he's calling you by name. And he's saying, come unto me. And you're wondering, do I go to him? Do I get out right here and pray? Do I listen to what this preacher's saying? Or is he not another just a false prophet? Is he, is he just a, a, a fake? And, a, and, and, and it's just a phony. He don't really love me. I do love you. God loves you more though. Jesus loved you enough to die for you. And I want to beg you tonight to fall out to mercy of him. And then go find yourself a church full of love. Go find yourself a church full of people who want to be like Jesus, who want to love like Jesus, who want to live like Jesus, who want to share like Jesus, and join yourself to that church and become a, a member of that body and then go out and affect all those in your community. That's what it's all about. We can't even get in our sanctuary tonight. What, well, what does that sanctuary matter? What matters the most is we are the church of Jesus Christ. I know we need to gather together. I desire to gather together. I know we need to worship together to strengthen one another. But that strength ought to be used to disperse us abroad out into the world to share the gospel message so that they don't have to go and cast themselves at the world when they see the bleakness of their situation. The Bible says in verse number five, the Bible says, and they rose up in the twilight to go into the camp of the Syrians and when they were come to the uttermost part of the camp of Syria, behold, there was no man there. For the Lord had made the host of the Syrians to hear a noise of chariots and a noise of horses, even the noise of a great host. And they said one to another, Lo, the king of Israel hath hired against us the kings of the Hittites and the kings of the Egyptians come to come upon us. Wherefore they arose and fled in the twilight and left their tents and their horses and their asses even the camp as it was, and fled for their life. So what happens when the lepers get there? The Syrians are gone. They, 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 God, the Bible says God made a great noise to enter into their camp of chariots and, and of horses and, and of a great host. And when, when they heard this, and, and listen to me, folks, listen to me. God should be the loudest voice in our lives. God's voice should, should, should out-trumpet everything else we hear. The voice of His Word, the voice of our prayer, the voice of His Holy Spirit, it should be louder than anything else we tune into in this life. But the Assyrians figured that out, that they heard this noise, so they all got up. They assumed that the, 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 the Israelites had went and hired a bunch of help, a bunch of warriors, so they fled for their lives. And here comes these four lepers, and there's nobody there. But the whole camp, the horses, the donkeys, the food, the garments, it's all still there. So, so the Bible says in verse number eight, 
And when these lepers came to the uttermost part of the camp, they went into one tent and did eat and drink and carried that silver and gold and raiment and went and hid it and came again and entered into another tent, tent and carried this also and went and hid it. Then they said one to another, we do not well. This day is a day of good tidings and we hold our peace. If we tarry till the morning light, some mischief will come upon us. Now therefore come, that we may go and tell the king's household. So they came and called unto the port of the city, and they told them, saying, We came to the camp of the Syrians, and behold, there was no man there, neither voice of man, but horses tied, and asses tied, and the tents as they were. And he called the porters, and they told it to the king's house within. And the king arose in the night, and said unto his servant, I will now shew you what the Syrians have done to us. They know that we be hungry, therefore they go out of the camp to hide themselves in the field, saying, when they come out of the city, we shall catch them alive and get them into the city. One of the servants answered and said, let some take, I pray thee, five of the horses that remain which are left in the city. Behold, they are as all the multitude of Israel that are left in it. Behold, I say, they are even as all the multitude of the Israelites that are consumed let us send and see. They took therefore two chariot horses and the king sent after the host of the sea and saying, go and see. And they went after them unto Jordan. And lo, all the way was full of garments and vessels which the Syrians had cast away in their haste. And the messenger returned and told the king. And the people went out and spoiled the tents of the Syrians. So a measure of fine flour was sold for a shekel and two measures of barley for a shekel according to the word of the Lord. And the king appointed the Lord on whose hand he leaned to have the charge of the gate when the people trod upon him in the gate. And he died as the man of God had said who spake when the king came down to him. You see the fulfillment? You see the bringing forth of God's word? These, these lepers, they, they, they get there and, 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 and the Bible said that, that, that it's empty. So what do they do? They, 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 they begin to eat and to drink. They begin to take silver and gold and raiment. And they went and they hid it. And, and, and then they came and they went into another tent. They did the same thing. They eat, they drink, they get the silver, the gold, the raiment, and they go and hide. But then you know what? They, they, they had this revelation that, hey, we're not doing what's right here. And church, let me say this. I believe there's a great message in that to us. When when, when, we, when we live off the provisions of God, and we're only here by His provisions, physically and spiritually, but when God's blessed us with so much and we choose to, to hide it in our tents, when we, we choose to consume, to eat and to drink and to hide it and not share it with somebody else, listen, that, that's part of what's wrong with the world today, that we have, when we, we, we have made our churches and, and, and an, exclusive, an exclusive place that excludes everybody that doesn't look just like we look or think just like we think or talk just like we talk or act just like we act. And listen, I, I, I understand. I understand that we've got to have rules of order and, and that we're supposed to live our ways in a manner. But first and foremost, we're supposed to be a witness. We're supposed to take what God blesses us with in the tent. We're supposed to go out and share it. The gospel message. And I'm telling you what, there are people that want to hear. There are people that want to eat of that holy manna and drink that living water. We just got to get it out there to them. They said, we do not well. These leopards had more forethought in their minds than, than the Israelites did. So they sent to the king, to the porter, and said, look, we went to the Syrian camp. There's nobody there. We, we found the horses and the donkeys and the raiment and the food and the drink. But there's no man there. And of course, the old king, he still had a doubt. He said, no, the Syrians, they're, they're just trying to trip us. They're lying in wait for us. Some little old messenger said, look, why don't we just take five horses and go see? Church, why don't we just go see in our communities who needs Jesus? Why, why, why don't we just go see if there's lost people down the road or up the road? What? what? Why, why don't we go see if some of these people that believe different than we believe or look different than we look, 
act different than we act. I could be changed by the blood of Christ like we was changed. You see, I was once lost and unto and on my way to hell too. And I wasn't on my way to hell because of, of, of who I was, but what I was. I was a sinner without God, separated by my sin. But by and through the blood of Jesus and Jesus only, I was given hopes. Why don't we go see? Why don't we send five horses out and let's go see? So that's what they did. And they came back. They said, I mean, we, we, we found their garments scattered everywhere. We, we found everything, but, but the sins are not there. So the Bible said the people went to the spoil. No king, he told that, that doubter, he said, I tell you what, he said, I want you to go and, 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 and I want you to be the, the to keep charge of the gate. And listen, the people were so hungry and they were so impoverished that they trod him underfoot and he died there. He died a doubter. Listen, when this thing breaks wide open and God gets ready to usher in a great revival, I don't want to be the one, I don't want to be the keeper of the gate because I doubt it and get run over by all those that's going out to, 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 to feel themselves on the glory of God. I, I want to be, I, I, I want to be ready. Dangers of doubting. Folks, that, that man missed it all simply because he didn't trust in the word of the Lord. He didn't believe that God could do what the man of God said he was going to do. Listen, one of these days, Jesus is coming back. He's coming back to take his church home to be with him, to live forever for an eternity with him. And until that day comes, I don't want to be found doubting his promises and doubting his assignments for my life. I, I want to be found faithful. The Bible said, I, I, I believe it's in 1 Timothy. He said, we've not been given the spirit of fear, but of love and of a sound mind and power. I don't want to live my life doubting. I, I, I've doubted God enough. God has proved himself enough that I should never doubt him again. So I, I hope you don't fall into the dangers of doubting. I, 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 I pray that you fall into the fortitude of faith. And they let God lead you and guide you through all this. And, and there's a lot, there's a lot we as saved people, we as the church can learn in that little passage of scripture. And God just showed me some of that as we was in the very time of preaching. Who are they going to go to when the situation gets bleak? When they're besieged by all the sinful things in the world and troubles on every hand, who are they going to turn to? Who are the lost people going to go to? Do they have enough confidence in the Jesus that they have seen in us? Do they have enough confidence in the Bible that they have read through us? Because I'm telling you right now, the masses out there in the world are not going to read the Bible. The only Bible they're going to read is the Bible that they read through me and you. Are they going to have enough confidence in what they've seen in that to come and to say, can you tell me about this man named Jesus? Or are they going to go to the world and are they going to go to the drug lords and say, give me a drug to make this pain go away. Give me a pill to swallow. Give me something to smoke. Give me something to drink. Are they going to run to the politicians and say, well, if you change this law, if you change that law, we can change all the laws, but until we get back to a nation under God, we're in trouble. That's the law that ought to rule the lands. God is supreme. And we need to worship Him, honor Him, and live for His glory and His honor. Who are they going to run to? And then when God does bless us and when God does give us what we need, how far are we willing to share it? We're going to hide it in our churches. We're going to box it up for a rainy day. We're going to wait for something bad to happen. And guess what? It's happening. You, 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 you want to know what the biggest pandemic in our land is right now? It's lost people are dying and going to hell by the hundreds of thousands every day. We as the church, we sit silent. 
You say, well, as long as we've got pretty buildings and as long as we've got good programs and as long as we've got good preaching and good teaching and we've got a bunch of upright people, then, then, then we can't do anything about that. It's not what my Bible says. Jesus said I, he was sent to the lost sheep. When are we going to go find the lost sheep? When are we going to go find those lepers? When are we going to share the good news of the gospel that they can be healed eternally from that spiritual leprosy by the blood of Jesus? I hope and pray this message has spoke to you as much as it has spoke to me. And God will touch you and use you and you'll see him work. Don't be a doubter. Be a believer. Let us pray. Lord, as we come to you once again, Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for your word. Lord, we, we, we thank you, dear Lord. That, Lord, you can speak to us, Lord, and, and, and Lord, through your word and through your spirit, and, and Lord, it be so plain and so clear and so powerful and so true. Lord, I thank you for challenging my heart tonight, dear Lord. Lord, have I, have I been the example that, that, Lord, that when people are besieged by, by, Lord, by all the evil and all the sin in the world, that they've seen enough of you and me that they would say that Jesus that Joey Gilbert has, I'm going to go throw myself in his mercy. Or, Lord, have they, they seen enough hatred and bitterness and anger and disputing out of me that they say, you know what, he's no different than anybody else. I'll just go throw myself to mercy of the world. God, help me. Help me, Lord, to be the light that you called me to be. Help me, Lord, to be transparent, Lord, that when people see me, they see you. Lord, I've already led way too many astray in my life by the way I've lived, by the way I've talked, by the way I've treated people. Lord, I hope and pray that it ends now. And God, you help me to be more like you, Lord. That people would just see you. And they may come and throw their self at your mercy like I did one time. And that you might save their soul, change their life like you did mine. God, you're the difference maker in my life. You're it. I love my mom and dad. But Lord, they couldn't do for me what you did. I love this country, but this country couldn't do for me what you did. The President of the United States could never do for me what you did, regardless of who it is. My education couldn't do what you did. Lord, you set me free from the bondage of my sin. You paid the price for my redemption. And I thank you for that. And never let me die. Lord, if you can save me from an eternity in a burning hell, then certainly you can use me for whatever days I've got left. So Lord, here I am. Use me. Use us all. I love you, Lord. I thank you for your word. I thank you that it spoke to me tonight if nobody else. We give you honor and praise and glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you for being with us tonight. Thank you for tuning in. We'll see you guys Sunday morning. We'll broadcast to the church. We, as far as I know, we will have a service in the sanctuary. If that were to change, we will let everybody know. But the church has been clean real good. And, uh, and we'll get back in Sunday. Unless something changes, and we will let you know. God bless you. Love all of you. If we can do anything for you, if we can pray for you, encourage you, reach out to us. Facebook, call us. My number is 678-780-8832. Feel free to call me anytime, tip, whatever. If we can be of any help, God bless you and have a great week is our prayer.